the important thing to say is, um, well, CRISPR is just a new form of technology, basically. It's just another platform um, for doing something that we were doing before. Um, the best analogy, actually, I have for this is it's a bit like the first smartphone to mobile phones and communication in general. Telephones existed before, mobile phones existed before, but we all kind of remember probably the first Apple iPhone that came out and thinking, okay, this is a total game changer. And it is. So CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9, as it's called, is a game changer because um, of its precision, importantly. Okay, it's significantly more precise um, and programmable than previous generations of technology available for um, altering and modifying DNA. And that precision means that we can achieve far greater results. It's also faster to utilize and leverage in the lab, so that's also important, and it's pretty cheap too, so all those things definitely help. But the reason why this has been so revolutionary is because of this programmable precision that it brings, um, meaning that now, basically, anything that we know of uh, that is encoded in DNA, whether it's in plants, animals, or human beings, is up for modification. Right, so that's exactly it. It's the precision, isn't it? Because what we're looking at here is being able to change the genetic codes. So we're talking about the, the genetic alphabet in any species, not just humans. Mm -hmm. And there's something specific about this specificity, isn't there, in terms of the kinds of diseases that this can impact. There's certain kinds of conditions that this is really, really good for. Well, I mean, well, yes. In particular, um, if you're thinking about human beings and if you're thinking about the diseases that human beings get, any disease that we know is attributable to a single disease, to a single um, gene, excuse me, in particular, is, is, a, is a prime candidate for this, for this technology. Because if you know with certainty this gene, A, whatever it is, causes this disease, we can now deal with it. Of course, not all diseases are attributable to a single disease, a uh, single gene, excuse me. And so, you know, there is some limitation there for, for what we could potentially do. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this precision is what's making it all so exciting. But there are some challenges and there are some current limitations with the technology in terms of using it more widely, aren't there? And is it is it simply that, that it's too precise to be able to be used for anything that's more complicated? Or, or are there other issues with it? No. So I think I would say just so, you know, just to remind you all, I'm sure you're all aware. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a, is a, or CRISPR for short, is a two-part molecular system, importantly. Um, there's the CRISPR bit, that's the bit that's programmable, that you can encode to say, this is the piece of DNA I'm looking for that I want you to go find. And then there's the Cas9 bit. And the Cas9 bit is the sort of doing end of, of the, the, the setup. And what's really fascinating about this technology is a bit like um, iPhones have changed over time. We've also already started modifying this platform. So you can change the Cas9 to have different functions and different um, effects, basically. And so there's actually quite a lot that you can do with this technology. In fact, you know, the, the, op the range of things that we can do is really quite wide. But um, in terms of limitations, um, well, if you think about it, um, CRISPR can be used to change DNA, but DNA exists in one copy per cell. And each one of us approximately is several trillion cells moving around through space, which means several trillion copies of genomes, which means if you want to change something, you, you, you've got a real delivery problem, basically. So the main limitation at the moment, or the big conundrum comes here, which is all of us start off life as one cell, and then we become several trillion cells. So we have this technology, it can be used to edit things in DNA, DNA is really important for health outcomes. At what point do you edit that DNA? Do you do it when you are one genome big in a single cell? Or do you do it when you are several trillion cells big and you've got a real delivery problem, right? Yes. So therein lies the problem. And therein lies the big ethical conundrums and some of the big questions <laughs> that have arisen around the idea of things like designer babies yeah. and what so forth. But we will, we will come to that. I think, sorry, just to, to, to be really explicit about this, the reason why doing an edit on a single-celled embryo is um, 
ethically questionable or, or causes some uh, questions to be raised is just to be really precise for everyone in the audience. The implication is if you edit embryos that are really, really small, you will edit the cells that will go on to make the egg and sperm cells in the next generation. And so you edit them as well. Whereas if you edit a body that already exists, it's called you know, somatic, you just change a body. You don't necessarily change the egg and sperm cells. So that's really important. Yeah, that's yeah. heritable. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And I'm really glad that you made that distinction because what we're talking about there is this idea that we could even potentially be editing the evolution of the human species, which obviously has massive implications. But I'd like to talk to Jimmy now and bring you into the conversation because in a way you embody what we're talking about, all of the science that we've just been talking about, which is absolutely fascinating. You've actually had first-hand experience of what gene therapy can be like. Now, you lived with a condition called sickle cell anemia since you were born. I wonder whether you could just tell the audience here, what is it like to have sickle cell? What was your experience of it? Just so that we can understand why it was so important for you to have the therapy in the first place. My experience with sickle cell was um, tough. It, sometimes it felt like, you know, climbing Mount Everest stacked on top of Kilimanjaro. It, there was no end in sight. Uh, constantly living out of hospitals. Um, of course, we all know the cornerstone of the disease is constant pain that just constantly lingers. And then all your organs are also at play in jeopardy. I've had a heart attack, gallbladder taking out, vascular necrosis. It's just um, insurmountable odds uh, uh, that actually makes it quite difficult to live. You know, so at, at some point in my life, I found myself really questioning the quality of my life, whether it's actually even worth living with everything that's going on with sickle cell. And, um, you know, with luck, I found CRISPR. I, I thought it was going to be a solution for the future, 20, 30 years in the future. And luckily, I found this article that came into my inbox and I qualified you know, for something that I thought was 20 years in the future, it, it happened two years after, um, you know, I'd had this discussion with my parents to try and figure out a way to improve my quality of life. And life post-transplant um, is, is surreal. It, every day I wake up, I'm still in awe. I'm still shocked as to what I'm able to do compared to what my life was like before uh, pre-transplant. You know, the a boundless amounts of energy that I had before I couldn't even climb a flight of stairs without taking a break to catch my breath. Now I need people, I need people to tell me to slow down because I, I just, you know, I'm constantly on the go because of how, um, how CRISPR has really changed my life. It, one of the things I feel like it's really given me is control. You know, for uh, as a young man, I, you know, as a teenager or, or, or a kid growing up, you feel like your parents kind of control your life because they're adults and they kind of direct you. And then, and then when you get older, you know, you get to this period where you think you're going to take control of your life. But in my case, I didn't have control of my life as well. Sickle cell directed every aspect in which my life went. And then, you know, as a 35-year-old man, I finally have control of my life, and it, it, it is um, unreal. Oh, Jimmy, it's really moving to hear you talk about the transformative effect that the gene therapy has had for you, and I'm so glad that you're able to share the story with us. Just to clarify for, for the audience who are listening, um, so sickle cell anemia is, is a, a disease that is basically caused by genetic uh, alteration in the hemoglobin structure. So that's what forms our blood cells. And when these blood cells are not forming in the normal way, they, be, they become sickle-shaped and they can have all sorts of different symptoms. And actually, I wonder whether, Jimmy, you could just tell us some of the other symptoms as well as pain that you had and how it would present for you. For you. Because again, I think it's just really important for people to understand the impact that conditions like this can have on ordinary people. Yeah, absolutely. I would have these, you know, really violent pain episodes that we'll call sickle cell crises that, you know, it's very difficult to describe. It just feels like your whole body just is in a, a wave of pain that can last for months, you know, where you need intravenous medication in order to control that pain. So that, you know, when I lived up north in, in, in the tri-state area, that, particularly in the winter months, that would happen almost twice a week, to two times. Sometimes, you know, I'd be living out of the hospital just to keep this pain under control. 
So that's one of the most important pieces of sickle cell is just that constant pain. And, and when it escalates and becomes chronic that you desperately need to seek hospital help, that's when it really gets bad. But then, like I said, you also have all because the blood cells are all your organs basically need good blood flow back and forth. And with sickle cell, you don't have that good blood flow. So I had a heart attack once because I wasn't having good blood flow to my heart. Um, my gallbladder had to be taken out at quite a, a young age as well because of the same similar reason of just not having enough blood flow to it. And then multiple pulmonary embolisms, you know, uh, acute chest syndrome, pneumonia. It, it, it's a, it, it, the disease is really the way it, manifest in your life and way it creeps into it it's actually sometimes hard to describe as obviously having a problem because it, it goes into every facet you know where you grow up where you where you plan to go to school relationships all, all of that it's um really really difficult yeah gosh and you're illustrating there again just how important it is to think about disease affecting every aspect of a person's life and especially as a child I mean this started when you were from the day you were born right um and what, what's really interesting to me and a bit of your story that I think is really interesting for the audience to hear is that when you were a child you were not in the states right you were in Nigeria and no. that's part of why the symptoms were so catastrophic in terms of the treatment that you were able to access and the healthcare there. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that and, and then also then how you then were able to get onto the CRISPR trial. Okay, um, so I was actually born here in the States. Uh, at the time, 1985 in Nigeria, they didn't have the amniocentesis test that would confirm if you have any gene genetic condition. Uh, my parents were fortunate enough to fly my, my mom over while she was pregnant to, to Washington, D.C. She had that amniocentesis test, which in fact confirmed that, you know, I would have sickle cell. And, you know, they still decided to, you know, bring me to life. Because back then, I pray my mom told me that, you know, the natural course of action, it, particularly if you're from Nigeria, because people or well, children with sickle cell in Nigeria didn't live past the age of five. So, you know, some doctors, they were of the belief that there is no point in bringing a child to life that's not going to see five years old. But because I was born here in the U.S., I got really fortunate. You know, they gave birth to me here. I became an American citizen. And, um, you know, we went back home, like you said, uh, to Nigeria for a little bit. And there was there's this one particular story I think I told you when we, uh, you know, touched base earlier was... Um, I used to do this thing as a young boy at the end of class. I'd go in, in front of the chalkboard, in front of the chalkboard and steal chalk. And I would find myself really taking all these weird substances and taking it home with me and find myself in the corner eating chalk, eating foam and really thinking I was going crazy. And then I moved over to the States and that thing that was happening, uh, th these behaviors that I was manifesting in Nigeria turned out to be a condition called pika, where you are lacking nutrients. So I was lacking a lot of nutrients because I had sickle cell, but you know, it, it just goes to show, like you said, the, at the time, at least the disparities in the two healthcare system. In one country, I thought I was nuts. And in the other country, it was actually turned out to be a condition that they were treating. And, you know, they gave me all these folic acid and all these things. So, you know, my body wasn't in need of those nutrients. Yeah. And, you know, just to draw out again that distinction between the different health systems, because I think this is really important for us to think about the global inequalities that exist, right, in terms of what's available. Um, you're lucky enough now to be able to talk to us about all of your experiences. You've had literally a 180 degree reversal of your fortunes. Um, and I don't think it's, a, it's exaggerating for me to say that it has been life changing for you. Oh, no, um, yeah. but, but of course, you know, that has come by being uh, in the United States where you've had access to this cutting edge technology. And I wonder how you think about the Jimmy that might have stayed in Nigeria or, or all the kids who are still in Nigeria and don't have access to this. How does that make you feel? That's a fantastic question because um, I'm a big believer in um, a stoic principle called Amor Fati, which is, you know, loving one's fate. And, you know, the irony of 
me saying this is not lost on me because I'm obviously through on the other side. But it, that's that statement simply, you know, simply it translated from Latin simply means, you know, being happy with the cards you're dealt, you know, no matter how tragic your situation is. You know, and if while I was in the throes of this disease, if someone would have said that to me, I'd have been pissed if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> but you know, I the the truth is, I I, I only time will tell. I mean, I, I definitely feel uh, and carry a lot of guilt too, as well, for people that are not going to get to access um, what I have access to, at least not in the next five to six years. Uh, There's definitely you know, me going through the process itself through a year, um, I I don't even, I can't even picture how it's going to be, you know, transported and made commercially ready for places like Africa and India where these therapies are desperately needed. You know, I know they're working on things called in vivo now where we don't have to do the conditioning that I had to go through. So, I'm guessing that's what it's going to be when these therapies can be taken as a pill, but I can see that still being, you know, the pill rather, just a simple infusion. But I still see that being, you know, decades and decades away from happening. Hopefully not. 